Welcome to Brixton University. From the creators of All American. Well, if it ain't Simone Hicks. Juggling school, tennis. It's your journey. What if I made the wrong choice coming to college here? You do you. You are looking at the new face of HBCU baseball. What if I'm not good enough? Basically, you're scared. Every damn day, bro. The series premiere. Never let anything keep you from your dream. All American Homecoming. Tonight on The CW. Tonight at 9, only on DCW 50. Washington CW. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. Hello everybody, it's Chris here. As you may have heard, there's a new James Bond film coming out called No Time to Die. I'm due to see it myself on Thursday and I'm looking forward to it. It struck me that it might be a good idea to have a special episode on Ian Fleming. So, today I'm joined by author Mark Simmons and we discuss his book... Ian Fleming's War. I hope you enjoy this episode. And just a quick note, our next episode will be out on the 5th of November. Take care. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me on. It's great to have you on. Please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your past work? Uh, I was uh, brought up in the West Country mainly. Mm -hmm. Dad was in the Navy, so we did have periods where we lived in Scotland and Malta. In the 1970s, or most of the 1970s, I was in the Royal Marine Commandos. I started writing, I suppose, in the 1980s. I wrote uh, mainly articles uh, on military history, travel, motoring, that sort of thing. And my first book was published in 2004, and uh, I've had um, 13 since then, I think. I'm working on number 14 at the moment. Ah, cool. Uh, can you tell us what number 14 is about, or is it top secret at the moment? <laughs> no, it's not a top secret. It is Alistair McLean's war. Ah, Alistair McLean, yeah, very interesting writer. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Which should be out uh, next year. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll keep an eye out for that. So you're joining me today because you've written this fantastic book called Ian Fleming's War that kind of goes into some of the real life intelligence experience Ian Fleming had that informed his later James Bond novels. So I suppose my first question about the book is sort of what what was it that inspired you to write this book? Oh, well, that's quite an easy answer to that one. (laughs) It was the the previous book. Mm which was uh, Ian Fleming and Operation Golden Eye, keeping Spain out of World War II. Yeah. Uh, that was um, where I really uh, came across, well, I knew, knew about Ian Fleming before that, obviously, but I really delved into him a bit there, although he isn't uh, the sole car- character in that book. There's a lot of other people in it as well. Yeah. But it did strike me as I was uh, researching Fleming. I, re- I read the two main biographies by um, Andrew Lysett and John Pearson. And it struck me that um, one devoted two chapters to his career in naval intelligence and the other one, one chapter. And I thought, well... There's a big gap here, so yeah. that was what inspired me to write Ian Fleming's War, which just concentrates really on those six years of his life and how it influenced, of course, his uh, writing. Yeah, definitely. So how did you kind of go about researching the books? You've mentioned the sort of biographies because there are quite a few books on Fleming. But what was it? How did you kind of go about diving into the sort of records and all that kind of stuff? Well, uh the wife and I went to Kew, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the National Archives, and spent quite a bit of time there uh, delving through the naval intelligence records. Um, also, the Imperial War Museum, I came across some eyewitness accounts of people who had served with Fleming, mm. which uh, I don't think anybody had uh, really 
explored before to any great depth. And um, those two real sources provided the core of the book. Of course, I reread all the uh, James Bond books, which was uh, quite a pleasure, actually, because I think they stand the test of time very well, actually, the uh, original books. Yeah, then they're fantastic books. Do you, may I ask, do you have a, a favourite James Bond book? Oh, yeah, from Russia with Love, I think. Yeah, yeah, that one and, and Non-Her Majesty's Secret Service are definitely my favourites. I think they're great books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic. Well, can you paint us a little bit of a picture of sort of Ian Fleming's life just before the war, before he joined Naval Intelligence? Yes, well, he was, um, you might say, a bit of a, a failure, it might be a too harsh a word, but he wasn't uh, a very happy person before mm. the war, I don't think myself. He had, um, much to his family's uh, chagrin, he'd failed at Sandhurst. Mm. He, he'd had to leave, or well, resign, he did. He failed the um, Foreign Office exam, which he was expected to pass. Then he, then he went to Reuters, the, um, and he quite enjoyed that as a correspondent. He had started off uh, um, writing articles about motor racing, actually, because, as we know, he was a bit of a petrol head, as yeah. was Bond. Yeah. And um, he even went on some rallies with Donald Healy, who, who uh, of course, um, started the Austin Healy uh, cars. And uh, he, he became a lifelong friend. They, uh, they uh, he was sort of the co-pilot in the Monte Carlo rally and Alpine rallies and things like that. And he was quite enjoying that, but the uh, it didn't pay very well, and his lifestyle was sort of um, supplemented by allowances from his family. Well, come the end, they they got a they sort of read him the right act that he had to stand on his own two feet, like. But they got him a job in the, as a merchant banker, which he, stockbroker, which he didn't, he hated, actually. And that was what, what he was doing when the, uh, he got the call from Naval Intelligence. But he, he didn't like the job, no. and he was um, a bit of a rake. He spent the money as quickly as he earned it, right? you know. He was living, even then, he was living beyond his means as such. So he wasn't a very happy person at the at the start of it. Well, just before the war started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I got the impression that um, in many respects, um, Ian Fleming, the war itself was actually probably the making of him. Um, I don't know if that's a fair assessment, but it certainly felt that way. Oh, absolutely. I think that's that's correct. Yeah. 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 Well, can you talk to us about how Ian Fleming ended up in working for naval intelligence during the war? Uh, well, Admiral Godfrey mm. uh, took over as the director of naval intelligence about six or seven months before the war started. Mm. He, he'd been on the fringes of uh, naval intelligence, but it was a new job to him. So he, he sought the advice of um, Reginald Blinker Hall, That's who it, had yeah. been the director of naval intelligence in the First World War, a very successful director. And... Um, we varied the discussions with him. He, he emphasised the point that um, Godfrey should not only have naval officers in, in his, his department, but a lot of civilians as well. Yeah. So as they would think outside the box, as they as they term it. And um, uh, Hall had had a stockbroker as his private secretary in the First World War. And so uh, uh, Godfrey knew some people in the banking sector and he approached them and they, they suggested Fleming. So he met him a couple of times and eventually he was in, uh, well, employed at Naval Intelligence. If he hadn't have been, he, he was uh, down to be a reserve officer in the Black Watch. So... He would have ended up in the Black Watch if uh, Admiral Godfrey hadn't have come along. So um, he, he started part-time afternoons. Mm. That was before the war actually broke out. 
And the, come the end of the conference, he made a comment that very often he felt like he was the secretary and Fleming was the director. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was a re- real ideas man, that's mm. what Fleming was. You mm. Know. Mm. Some of them are absolutely crazy, but others were... Very good, you know. Yeah, yeah. He had a, I, I can't remember if I read it in your book, but somebody said he had something like a six to one ratio of ideas or something. So, That's right, about yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, fantastic. And he was, in, I think, if I remember correctly, he was, his, um, Fleming himself was inspired by a lot of sort of fiction, like Bulldog Drummond oh, and things yeah, like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, the Riddle of the Sands, that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah. John Buchan. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. No. Fantastic. And Ian, Ian Fleming as well had a couple of brothers who were in the war. Um, was it Michael and obviously Peter and um, and they they were kind of because I got the impression Ian Ian was a bit um, he had itchy feet when uh, when a, a naval intelligence sort of behind a desk and um, and obviously his brothers were out there kind of in in the action and um, and I think obviously the social pressures of that time as well were probably playing on his mind. Yeah. Of course, Michael was killed in the war. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Peter, um, he, he worked in uh, more in the intelligence in the field, out in uh, the Far East and India mm. a lot, yeah. Also, I think, Ian, was he in sort of a little bit in the shadow of his father growing up, wasn't he? Um, well, his father was killed in the, in the First War. Mm. So uh, he was largely brought up by his mother, who was a bit of a domineering character. I suppose uh, they had this image of their father, you know, the hero that had died in the First World War. Mm. No, it's interesting. Well, look, your, your your book does a fantastic job of going into detail many of the operations Ian Fleming was a part of. And sadly, we won't better go through all of them, but uh, it's more reason why people should get your book. But um, I'd love to discuss a few of them. And one that one that popped out straight away was Operation Goldeneye, which Ian Fleming named his house after in Jamaica. Can you talk to us about Operation Goldeneye? Yeah, Operation Goldeneye was um, a stay-behind operation if the Germans had moved in to Spain and Portugal. Mm. Uh, by that, I mean it, uh, there would be sabotage teams that would blow up railways and bridges, that sort of thing. And it was subdivided into two operations. Operation Sprinkle, I think if memory serves right, was if the Germans had in, uh, been invited into Spain. As, as we know, Franco was a fascist and he had been supported by Hitler and Mussolini during the Spanish Civil War. So there was um, a lot of people thought that Franco would align with Hitler. Mm, mm. And then there was Operation Sconce. That was if the Germans invaded Spain. That was the Spanish didn't invite them in. And Mm. um, a lot of teams were trained in Scotland by the SOE, a lot mostly Spanish people ready for this of course this was um, it was only um, put on alert twice I think during the war because of course the Germans didn't move into Spain but it was uh, uh, hatched by Ian Fleming who was sent out to Spain shortly after um, France fell Mm. and Alan Hilgarth who was the Naval Attache in Madrid, they cooked up this idea of uh, the stay-behind teams. And then um, Ian Fleming actually came up with the name, Golden Eye, for the operation. But of course, it was never implemented. But it was the closest uh, Fleming got to being a secret agent because he went out there in civilian clothes. He took a this... Um, a pen with cyanide in it and a commando knife and all yeah. this with him, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was, he was playing the role as such, you know. So you can see why the name was close to his heart with naming the house after Yeah, that. absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's another operation he was involved with called Operation Roofless, which some of those details appear in Thunderball, which, uh, in the novel. That's right, Thunderball. Mm. Um, Roofless was, um, that was, about 1940, that was. Um, during the, uh, this was during the uh, Battle of Britain and the start of the Blitz, so, so to speak. A uh, naval uh, 
the Navy were very keen to get hold of some uh, German naval code books. And um, um, Fleming came up with this idea that there have been reports that uh, fast German launchers were going into the channel to pick up downed Luftwaffe pilots who had crashed into the sea and they were going out to pick them up. So uh, Fleming came up with this idea that they had a captured German Heinkel bomber that they would send out at the end of a raid as if it was in distress, crash it into the sea mm. with a, a British crew on board that would all be German speakers. And they'd wait for this uh, rescue launch to come up, and then they'd overpower the crew and take the launch back to the UK with the code books. <laughs> this was the idea. And it was all um, ready to go, actually. But Fleming wanted to go himself, but Godfrey wouldn't let him. <laughs> and uh, the crew was ready to go and everything. But on the two raids that... Um, the Germans had on the Portsmouth area because that's where the aircraft was. There was no reports of launches coming out, so it never, never went off. But of course, crashing into the sea is the thunderball where they um, Spectre capture this uh, British bomber and crash it into the sea, which has got uh, atomic bombs on it. We We've all seen the film or read yeah, the book. Yeah, And that's where the idea came from. And also, um, they have the Disco Volante where they um, put the take the bombs off the crashed aircraft into the Disco Volante. And, of course, that, that came out, which had a false bottom that opens up. That came from the, uh, when he came across the Italian commandos in Gibraltar. That we're using a ship with a uh, false under the water line where their frogmen came out into Gibraltar and attached Olympic mines to ships in Gibraltar, who were very successful, the uh, ex mass, the Italian commandos. They were famous. They, they, in Alexandria Harbour, they sank two British battleships. Yeah, which was. Uh, we were, very, we were very lucky that there was quite shallow water, so they just rested on the bottom. And they could be refloated eventually, but they were put out of action for about six months, these two battleships. Yeah, yeah. I always find, looking back on the war, because we know the ending, it's kind of, pre I don't know if it's presented as a bit more coherent and people are kind of um, cooperating more, but when you look into the history of the war, it just seems a lot more dysfunctional than it appears in the films. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm always surprised, especially about the 1940, because it, it, it was the very real impression that the Germans might invade Britain. It was, um, and I didn't realise sort of how um, close it felt. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, I, I don't think it was as close in reality mm. as what people thought. Actually, but there we are. Mm, but yeah, yeah, I know there's a lot of elements that would uh, make that hard logistically. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah. definitely. Well, um, there's a very interesting operation about luring a senior Nazi official, Rudolf Hess, to the UK in 1941. Can you talk to us about this interesting chapter? I don't think that um, Fleming was actually that involved in it. A lot mm. of people have suggested he was. That's why I wrote the chapter on it. Um, Especially Knight, the director of MI5, suggested that he and Fleming cook this idea up. But uh, I would uh, question that, really, that he ever had much to do with it. Other than um, Alistair Crowley, the uh, occultist, did write a letter to uh, Admiral Godfrey offering his assistance. When Hess had arrived, that was because uh, Hess was a bit obsessed with the occult, as they say Hitler was, you mm. know. So uh, uh, there's been an awful lot written about it, but uh, I don't think that really Fleming was that involved. Um, a lot of people point towards uh, Ian Fleming being involved because Peter Fleming wrote a book, mm. The Visit, I think it's called, where Hitler 
comes over Britain to gloat how the Luftwaffe are destroying all the cities, and the plane he comes over and crashes, and he uh, he tries to reveal himself to the British, and nobody will believe him who he is. <laughs> And eventually they send him back in another plane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He has this sort of weird little adventure, doesn't he? He ends up sort of befriending locals, and yeah, <laughs> tongue-in-cheek comedy thing. But the, the the strange thing about it, he wrote it about six months before Hess arrived. Yeah. So a lot of people think that's how uh, Ian Fleming was involved, but I don't think he ever was really. Other than he did go and see Crowley down mm. in Torquay. Mm. And um, I think Fleming was a bit in, interested in the occult as well. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, Crowley, I believe, is the inspiration for Le Chief in the novel. That's right, yeah. Mm. That's the big inspiration he was, mm. yeah. In, in Casino Royale, yeah. 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 Because a lot of people talk about Ian Fleming's connection of helping create the CIA as even a scene in the TV show Fleming, uh, which was made about 10 years ago, I think, where he, he uh, he's meeting with senior American intelligence officials in the OSS and, um, and then he writes this sort of memo overnight that could have provides a blueprint for a central intelligence agency. Can you talk to us a bit about this period? I think it was a bit more than a memo. Yeah. Um, he was uh, locked in a room, well, they say he was locked in, but he was in a room for several days, apparently, mm. and it ran to 70 pages. So, oh, wow. Uh, he, he did it for uh, Donovan, who would become the head of the OSS. Of course, um, Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, was against any other organization being formed. <laughs> so there was a lot of infighting in the States about this. Um, a lot of people pour uh, cold water on this, but it is revealing that Donovan gave um, Fleming an inscribed uh, revolver. Yes, yes. Order it, for services rendered, written on it, or something like that. Yeah, it's know. a cult police positive. I think I saw it. Yeah. There was a brilliant yeah. exhibition in, tw- in 2008 at the uh, Imperial War Museum, and it was sort of like Ian Fleming's personal items, and there was all sorts of things from a... Yeah, there was a, a cult python, which was uh, a revolved from the 50s, and there was the police positive, which was the one the American... Yeah, Donovan gave him. Uh, Faz- yeah. yeah, really so, great stuff. So I think he did have some influence on the... Mm. Uh, Start of the OSS, which of course later became the CIA. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and and Fleming had interesting connections with William Stevenson, who was the head of the BSC. In, yeah, that's in, right, yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's any any thoughts you have on on that at all, because that's a really interesting area. He's a, he was a great admirer of, of William Stevenson. Mm. Yeah, mm. and uh, of course he went on this raid of the uh, Japanese embassy with mm. Him. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> in New York. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he, he Fleming uh, considered uh, Stevenson to be a real spy, you know, whereas he was uh, more of an office man, really. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that raid um, he fictionalizes in the opening of Casino Royale yeah, is how right, double, right, yeah, yeah, how Bond gets his double O status. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's another. Uh, PCUs, yeah. Yeah. One other big thing that comes up often with Ian Fleming is the creation of 30 Assault Unit, which I think some people called Ian's Red Indians. I don't know if you um, you could tell us a little about that sort of area. Yeah, that was... Um, they formed this um, assault unit, which was mainly Royal Marine Commandos and Naval Officers. Mm. Did have occasionally people from other uh, branches of the services operating mm. with it. Mm. The main role was uh, when they uh, went in on a landing, or they would go in with the uh, almost with the assault troops, and the idea was to capture any intelligence they could, um, code machines, documents, anything they could find. Mm. Which and it was a very successful. Um, uh, not so much in the, the first operations they went on, but in Sicily, on the landings in Sicily, they uh, captured fairly early the um, German codes for a radar direction of their fighters, which they immediately got to the RAF, which made a big difference to their bombing rates. 
that they could uh, block the uh, German radar signals to their fighters. So uh, things that they also did that in, in, in Holland. They managed to get the radar codes for the entire European sector from the German, and they could block their radar completely. Mm. Until the, obviously the Germans would get wise to it, and then they change the code. But uh, you know, it gave them an advantage for a few weeks, probably. You know, which was quite quite, uh, quite uh, an achievement, really. Yeah, definitely. And all sorts of things they found. Um, you know, coal machines were quite common. They uh, towards the end of the war, they even managed to get hold of the entire German naval records. In a castle in Germany, that was when Germany was collapsing, really. But it was quite an achievement because where this castle was, uh, Fleming actually went on that because oh, he called he? it Dra- oh. Dracula's Castle. <laughs> 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 yeah, he went there for three days to uh, see this library of all the documents, and. And he got them shipped back to the UK. They got a, a trawler out there to, because there were vir- virtually tons of these documents, the entire German naval records, right? which was quite an achievement. That was at the very end of the war. Yeah. So was it as tactically helpful? I don't know, but it's yes, yeah, fascinating, isn't it? No, uh, not so much tactically helpful. I suppose for the future, really, mm. because. There was a lot of the Germans were quite advanced on their U-boats at, at, at the end of the war. And um, we got a lot of the information on that. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I know the Germans frequently shared tactics with the Japanese. And I believe even the, the Pearl Harbor raid may have been based on, I think it might have been the British raid on Mers al-Kabir, but I could be wrong. But there's certainly... The raid on Toronto. Oh, was, was it? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We we attacked the Italian fleet at Taranto with yeah. aircraft. Mm. Yeah, and uh, we sank uh, two or three battleships. Yeah, the the Japanese would have been well aware of the uh, raid on Taranto. Mm. Yeah, so all that kind of information is very useful. Yeah. I'd just, one thing I'd like to just quickly talk about a bit more is Ian Fleming's relationship with Admiral John Godfrey, because some sort of have painted him as a bit of a father figure to Ian Fleming. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I suppose he was in a way. Um, he was certainly a big influence on Fleming. Mm. Of course, he um, he was only there for about the first three years. Yeah, yeah. He, he got the sack eventually because he rubbed, rubbed people up the wrong way. He was a bit of an abrasive figure, and um, Churchill wasn't all that fond of him. And I think uh, there was a bit of a feeling that people were out to cut him down to size because what happened was... Um, Admiral Cunningham was the commander-in-chief in the Mediterranean. Mm. So naval intelligence were able to share all their intelligence with the commander-in-chief. So he shared it with Cunningham. Mm. Well, then Cunningham was sent to Washington as uh, the naval li- liaison with the Americans. And he kept on sharing all the intelligence with Cunningham. But he wasn't a commander-in-chief then. So that's what they got. They said, you shouldn't be doing this. And um, and the um, Admiralty wouldn't support Godfrey, and that's how he got the sack, basically. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it was only a technicality, really. Mm. Mm. But they may have been looking for that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And of course, um, I forget the name of the chap that took over. Oh, um, Edmund Rushbrook, yeah. Uh, That's right. Yeah, Admiral. He took over. But he, he didn't really want the job. Mm. <laughs> and a lot of people say that um, when he took over, it was Fleming that actually held the whole thing together, really. Oh, wow. Yeah. What was that transition like for Fleming? That must have been, in some ways, quite sad because Godfrey's going. But as, as as you're painting a picture of him, he gets the um, rule of the roost, so to speak. It might have been quite positive for him, too. I suspect he had mixed emotions on that, but mm. uh, there was so much going on that I suppose you had to get on with it. Like, you know. mm. He certainly used uh, Godfrey as the blueprint for him in the, in the books, mm. no doubt about that. Mm. Because you even have Repulse mentioned, which was Godfrey's last seagoing command, was 
against the battle cruiser Repulse, which was sunk by the Japanese off Malaya in 1941. But uh, that was is often mentioned in, I think, two of the bomb books. It's mentioned Repulse. Mm. He doesn't even change the name of the ship, you know. So, so he obviously had a big. Uh big um yeah admiration for him i know i i think i've read godfrey um even commented on it years later saying something on the lines of he hopes he wasn't and wasn't based on him but <laughs> i think it was largely yeah. Yeah, definitely there were one or two other people that they suggested like knight of mi5 might have been and uh Stuart Menzies, the director of um, I6, mm. you know, but mm. that, I think it's mainly Godfrey. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, as the war ended, Ian Fleming did have the possibility to sort of remain in intelligence. I think he even had a potential to go and join MI6, but he chose not to. So can you talk to us a little bit about his later life and what led up to writing his obviously famous novel, Casino Royale? Well, he, um, as you say, he had the opportunity, but he decided against it because he thought the uh, the uh, peacetime intelligence might be too boring. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he had an offer to go and um, be the foreign correspondent of the Times, uh, the director of foreign correspondence. So he uh, took that up and... Um, because uh, before the war, that had been the job he'd enjoyed most when he was in correspondent. So um, that's what he did uh, immediately after the war. Yeah. And he had a friend, Ivor Price, who um, he got to find a plot on Jamaica. And a part of his contract with the, the Times was he got two months of the year off, which January and February, which he went to Jamaica then. And... Um, uh, Bryce got him this plot on Jamaica where he built Golden Eye, the bungalow. And um, he used to go there, he used to um, sail across the Atlantic on one of the Queens and then take the train from New York to the Florida and fly from Florida to Jamaica. That's how you had to do it at that time, of, at the, just at the end of the war, 1940s to 50s. And... Um, uh, it was uh, he got married actually to uh, Anne Rothermore. Mm. That wasn't her uh, maiden name because she was uh, been married a couple of times before, and uh, they got married. And uh, she says that he he wrote Casino Royale because he got married, but <laughs> yes. I don't know about that. But anyway, it was at that time he did write it um, in uh, 1952. Mm. They say he wrote it in about six weeks. Mm. And it was in this two-month leave he used to have. And after Casino Royale, every while he was at the Times, well, he remained at the Times for a while, and he used to, um, in this two-month leave, he used to write another book. And, uh, of course, Casino Royale came out of um, his time at Estero and in Portugal and with the, um, his time in Spain as well. Although he sat, set it in France, it was based on the uh, those um, times in Estero. Which um, uh, Popoff, the uh, double agent... Uh, in his book, he says Fleming was watching him when he he, <laughs> he bet thirty thousand dollars on the turn of a card yeah. <laughs> in the Astro Old Casino, and he he says he based Casino Royale on that, you know. And Popoff was supposed to be Bond, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Popoff was a Yugoslavian. He was a mm. double agent. Yeah. Yeah, Dusko Popoff. Yeah, fa fascinating yeah. fascinating yeah. character. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Well, one of my last questions really is um obviously there's a lot of speculation about who who James Bond's based on and obviously I don't think there's a single person. But um what are your thoughts on who the character of James Bond could be based on? Well, it's mostly Fleming himself obviously. Mm. Um, um Popoff might have been uh, I I rather uh, Commander Crab, uh, Lionel Crab. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, fascinating figure. I, I, I rather like him because, mm. um, of 
course, Fleming was keen on uh, diving. In fact, when Casino Royale came out, he missed the uh, launch because he was diving with Jack Crystal. And uh, he was very keen on diving. And, of course, the Lionel Crab business about how he died when he went there. Was sent. He was too old at the time. He was sent to um, dive under a, a Russian cruiser that was visiting Portsmouth, which was a MI6 operation, which was completely bungled. And uh, of course, he died, and his body was found a few months later. But mm. Uh, mm. yeah. Well, he's. Do you know what's interesting? Actually, I mean, uh, again, pure speculation. But um, Lionel. Crab's handler was also the man who um, went to interview Kim Philby in uh, in Beirut and and possibly let Kim that's Philby right. go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He wasn't very good, actually. <laughs> no, so poor old uh, Lionel Crabs was sort of doomed, really, being assigned to that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. there was his pan- friend Peter Smithers. He mm. was very fond of him and. Mm. There might be elements of uh, the Bond character from Peter Smithers. Mm. He was the naval attache in uh, Mexico. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I know some people have mentioned um, uh, Sidney Riley, Ace of Spies. I don't know if um, any thoughts. Oh, yeah, that? that's another one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's going back a bit too far, really. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think, was Fleming reading about him in the files or something, I believe? But Yeah, probably, yeah. 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 Well... <laughs> Mark, thank you for all of that today. Where can listeners find out more about you and your excellent book? Well, I've got an author's page on Amazon, and I'm on Facebook. Mm. You can contact me on Facebook. Uh, I've got a writer's page on Facebook. But I also have got a, um, we do some book fairs in the Southwest, yeah. so they can always meet me in a book fair, and there's a book fair page on Facebook as well. Excellent, excellent. So they should put in Mark Simmons to Facebook and Mark Simmons to Amazon, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, that's it. Well, that's Ian Fleming's War. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, it's been great to have you on. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. From the creators of All American. Well, if it ain't Simone Hicks. Juggling school, tennis. It's your journey. What if I made the wrong choice coming to college here? You do you. You are looking at the new face of HBCU baseball. What if I'm not good enough? Basically, you're scared every damn day, bro. The series premiere. Never let anything keep you from your dream. All American Homecoming. Tonight on The CW. Tonight at 9, only on DCW 50. Washington CW.